Okay, so I see uh, participants increasing as we open up our webinar for this Monday. Hello, my name is Marty Andres from Arizona State University. Uh, I'm a colleague of Marco and Mike, Rim, Jim, and Ruth. Uh, uh, today we're uh, <clears throat> broadcasting our webinar that's co-hosted by the Center for Behavior Institutions and the Environment at ASU, the International Association for the Study of the Commons, which is also uh, at ASU, and the Resilience Alliance. Um, I'm seeing the attendees are increasing here. I may wait just a little bit longer um, before we get started. Um, okay, so it looks like we're stabilizing here. Um, I'd like to welcome our two uh, speakers today. Uh, Ruth Meinson Dick from the International Food Policy Research Institute based in Washington, D.C. Uh, she coordinates the CGI <clears throat> AR program on collective action and property rights. She has a long history of working in India on collective action problems, uh, starting way back, correct me if I'm wrong, working on tank irrigation systems. Our other speaker, uh, Rim Jim Agarwal, <clears throat> is a professor in the School of Sustainability here at Arizona State University. And uh, a central focus of her research uh, is on examining the links between globalization, resilience, social ecological systems, and human well being. So, like last time, our, our um, format will be each speaker will have a, about 10 to 15 minutes to share some ideas around this topic of uh, research during uh, COVID 19. Um, Ruth will start off for her first 15 minutes and then we'll switch to Rim Jim. With that, let me turn it over to uh, Ruth. Thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity to, to join in this conversation and to Rim Jim for suggesting this uh, title for our overall session. Um, so I thought I would start with my March to April travel planner which was supposed to be starting off going to Ahmedabad and then starting a project initiation workshop on games for experiential learning and water management in Anand Gujarat with Foundation for Ecological Security. Then a weekend in Delhi and then a homestay with members of the Self-Employed Women's Association near Ahmedabad and then uh, a year two project workshop on innovative use of ICTs for extension on climate smart agriculture practices with SEWA and a grassroots women's organization from Kenya and Uganda National Extension Service. All of that reminded me by about mid-March of Woody Allen's quote that if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. As you all know that, or can surmise, that didn't happen. Before I tell you, I mean, and that was really disappointing to me. For one thing, in of all the places I work, India has special meaning to me because that's where I grew up. I've been working on this for a long time. And this Games for Experiential Learning project also is, means a lot to me. I've been working with Marco and colleagues on building up to this for years. It's been really exciting because as many of you know, games have been, collective action games have been used to measure propensity for collective action, but we've been testing whether they can actually strengthen collective action by improving people's understanding of the relationships, affecting the individual behavior and allowing people to try out different institutional arrangements. These pictures are from where we had done a proof of concept. We had shown that they significantly increased the likelihood that people would develop rules for governing groundwater. And separately, Thomas Falke and others from ICRISAT for surface water. And we had funding to scale this up to 3,500 communities in India. And, but as you can see, 
the whole point of this was that it was supposed to be experiential. These were not just tablet-based apps, but they were to allow people to interact with each other and have a whole community debriefing. That wasn't going to happen with social distancing. What happened instead is, first of all, there were travel restrictions on international travel to India. And then, actually, during our workshop, planned workshop, there were the lockdowns of all Indians not allowed to go out. Our NGO partners, both Foundation for Ecological Security, or FES, and SEWA, shifted into massive relief mode, especially dealing with migrants and poor and women. If you can see here, they're distributing supplies and there are these circles that show people how far they need to stay apart. There was going to be no field work for research and there's just a huge cognitive burden of all of us about worrying about others, but especially our NGO colleagues who are dealing with people who are really, really hurting in India. Okay, so what do we do? I think part of what I was feeling was we needed some sense of agency, some sense that we were doing something. So can you have ICTs come to the rescue? Well, first of all, we did remote meetings. There is the question of though, how do you create real connections in a virtual space? Especially that a uh, games workshop was bringing together people from Germany and ASU and uh, different groups in India who had never worked together. And we had plans about playing the games together to get ourselves really all on the same page. And then, you know, a very interactive workshop to plan out the work plan. We had to switch. I brought in uh, Stefan Dorn, who I've worked with a lot to help advise on this. And a lot of that, when people switch to online meetings, they just focus on the technology. But we had to think a lot more about the process. And the analogy Stefan gave me was that if you're in a swimming pool of three feet of water, you could keep trying to walk, but that's not the efficient way to do it. You need to learn to swim. So we had to think about meeting in a different way. Then the other part is the use of phones and ICTs. Are in, um, first of all, we've been seeing a lot more of use of phones for coordinating collective action, like for calling on irrigation work days. Then phones got used uh, quite strongly in India to communicate about COVID-19, like every mobile phone call for a while started with warnings about and information about COVID-19. Even if you're calling your neighbor, you got that pre-recorded um, message. Then we switched into looking at phone surveys for research. Um, especially on the impact of COVID-19 and of the lockdowns. This started with SEWA, our partners, saying that they were really concerned about what was happening with their members. And so we've been working with them and then USAID wanted in more information about what's the impact and a number of organizations. So we're looking, we've designed these surveys that should be fielded uh, we're doing enumerator training this week on food and water security. How have employment, income, and women's empowerment changed? Now, there's been a lot of enthusiasm. Oh, phone surveys then are, are you know, can substitute for face-to-face -face research. And there are some advantages. There's possibilities for doing them as rapid response. They're certainly a lot cheaper than face-to-face. -face. We may get good responses now um, uh, because even in the U.S. there have been studies showing that people are eager to talk now when they're in lockdown and especially when we're following up on previous surveys where the, 
the people kind of know us. And I think there are, even when you do face-to-face -face surveys, there's a potential to use um, the phone surveys as a follow-up. There's some really important limitations though, and the more we dig into this, the first is that there's a selection bias. The people who are most likely to um, have phones are the wealthier, the younger, and men rather than women. Now, if we're really concerned about poor rural women, they are the least likely to have phones. Then you can't guarantee the privacy of the respondent, and they may not have good reception. They may not. Uh, they may be low on phone chart. You know, uh, phone battery. A lot of phone surveys have had very low response rates. I said this may change. In our case, we don't know, and you have to do them really short. Um, and the thing is, you don't, you, as we go into this, I'm realizing more and more how much we rely on nonverbal information on when we're asking questions. And especially in the context of our games project, phone things are not as experiential. I do want to highlight these two resources uh, because there's a lot going on and you know if you want more on that go to those. So in brief then looking ahead that's where we are right now and this has gotten me thinking about well what will be the new normal. First of all I think coming out of this there will be less travel and more virtual meetings. Um, already, IASC, the International Association for Study of the Commons, had started with a, um, they were going to do a virtual conf Africa conference. And I had started talking at IFPRI about, well, we need to do more meaningful virtual meetings for the carbon savings, but also because virtual meetings can be more democratic because you don't have to buy a ticket to come together. Um, I think there will be more phone surveys, especially as phone access uh, penetration increases and people become more um, familiar with it. But on the other side, I think all of this is going to give us a much greater appreciation for where, when, and why it's important that we come together in person not just face-to-face -face over a video screen, but really in person. There are aspects of building and maintaining solidarity through doing things together. And that whole aspect of experiential learning, I think, is really important. Um, it's especially important for natural resource management because the difference between talking about a forest versus walking through the forest together um, is just a huge difference. And I think aside from the knowledge part of it, there's this, there's this multi-sensory aspect of being together in person of eating and drinking together that creates bonds, walking together. There's, and then there's also, I, and there's some research on, on sort of the effect of walking. Um, even since, since uh, Plato, the aspect of walking together and discussing has been, you know, recognized as something that creates something new. And there's an aspect of serendipity I know a lot of people think of serendipity as things that ha happen randomly. I'm sort of want to, to write about planned serendipity, that you create space for random things to happen, random connections to happen. The Bellagio Center, uh, for example, requires artists and um, 
musicians and researchers that they're hosting, the one requirement is every day you must come to dinner together because the serendipity of the interactions that happen through that. And, you know, I was there one time at a workshop and because of this, I ended up introducing this woman who works in Honduras to the first Mesquita doctor from Honduras and they started collaborating together. So that plant, that aspect of coming together. So just looking ahead, I think there's going to be an expanded research agenda on the effects of different forms of interaction on creating different forms of bonds and collective action. I would be really excited to you know, participate in this, provided there's ever any money for research again. So I just want to thank you all for, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation and for keeping these kinds of interactions going even when we can't come together in person. Thanks a lot. And over to Rim Jim. Um, thank you, Ruth. We'll swap over to uh, Rim Jim here in a second. Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, your, your comment about increasing participation and making our interactions with the people we do collaborative research with more democratic, I thought was quite insightful. And uh, this notion of it really increasing the value of when we're together, you know, you spend all this time in an airplane and you show up somewhere and you do it so often that it's sort of like every other day. But now it might be really, yeah, really different, really much more valuable and we'll appreciate it very much more. Uh, thank you again. And now I'll switch over to Rim Jim <clears throat> to take us uh, on her journey. We've got your presentation up now, but you're still muted, Rim Jim. Yes, now do you see my screen and my presentation mode? Oh, Perfect, sorry. we see okay. it. Okay, one second. There you go. Yeah, okay. So um, thank you very much for inviting me um, and thanks to all those who are attending. Um, this is a new mode of operation and um, I'm very grateful for you all to join us today. So, okay. Um, okay, so uh, Ruth has done a great job, I think, of laying out all the challenges of um, switching over to the virtual environment. I would like to spend a few minutes reflecting on the title that we selected uh, for this webinar, which we are calling Balancing Opportunity and Opportunism. So what do we mean by first by opportunity? So I'm sure as researchers, some of you may be students, you are bomba being bombarded by these calls for funding and special issues of journals, which all require a rapid response. And personally, we might also be feeling this need to be able to do something. What can we do to help? And this personal impulse is often kind of seductive. We are in what David uh, Manuel Navarrete was talking about in the last webinar about um, being in an achievement society where we constantly feel pressured for doing something. So on the one hand, there is this opportunity from outside, and then we have this personal impulse. But I think we also need to make sure that we are not rushing into this. It can be very seductive, but we need to be careful that we have time for reflection on what research means in this current environment. And this leads me then to this uh, idea about opportunism, because not only we are thinking about it, every actor ranging from political actors to corporate actors to NGOs, uh, 
and everyone is thinking about how do they make the best out of this crisis. So there is sort of a competition for doing good that's going on. And this brings us to this question of ethics of doing research. And we need to think very carefully in this current environment, particularly when we are thinking about doing research in, um, in areas which are struggling for livelihoods and for just keeping alive about the burden we may be imposing by um, visiting field sites. And what does our presence mean at this time? And this would definitely be true for if we are there in person, what burden we may be imposing, but also I think virtually um, what burden we may be imposing by requiring people to get online and um, get on to um, you know, these virtual Zoom meetings, et cetera. And uh, as we think about fieldwork, many of us are thinking, okay, so this just means postponement, but as came out in Ruth's lecture also, that probably we are talking about a new normal. So I'd like to open my talk by inviting us to use this opportunity to rethink not just our, re our specific research agenda, but more broadly about how we collect data, how we engage, and how then we evaluate research. So how will we evaluate the peer reviewed articles that come out during this, um, during this period? So I think more broadly speaking, and I would leave this question open for Q and A earlier, uh, later, um, that I think we need to use this opportunity to rethink the whole research process. So now with that, I come to a briefly talking about my current research. So my uh, research earlier, my stemming back to my dissertation research was on rural areas. But more recently, I've been looking at urban India. And I was also raised in urban India, in Delhi particularly, and uh, my ongoing research is on water governance and the human right to water and sanitation in mega cities. So we have a research project that we just wrapped up, which was looking at this issue in three mega cities, Johannesburg, Sao Paulo, and Delhi. And for this presentation, I'll talk a little bit about the Delhi work um, and uh, begin with why did we think about human right? What is so special about this thinking about the human right perspective to water and sanitation? So as I mentioned, I grew up in Delhi and one thing that always struck me was that nearly half of Delhi's population lives in what are called slums. And this is similar to many mega cities in the developing world, particularly Mumbai also has uh, something like 42 to 50% of population living in slums. And for the population living in slums, we have virtually no planning for basic services. So there is no formal regulation, there is no formal provision from the government for basic services. And so this question is, who is looking after them? Who is really, who really cares about them? And while thinking about this question, I was intrigued by the idea of human right to water and sanitation. Now, this right is part of the South African constitution. It's written into it very explicitly. But in the Indian constitution, it has been used very innovatively by lawyers and advocacy groups to use what in the constitution is called the human right to dignity and use basic services as part of dignity of life. And the interesting thing about human rights is that you can use that as an instrument to hold governments accountable. So in places where the executive has not been delivering on, on the social contract, on providing basic services, to what extent can human rights be used as a leverage that development alone has lacked? So that was our motivation. And although you know, human rights is potentially an instrument, our research was basically looking at 
how far have these rights been able to transform social reality? And how, what are the gaps and how do communities mobilize to uh, take up cases in the court? How do the lawyers help them? Um, there are various uh, NGOs related to uh, providing legal help. Um, and then there are um, the question of how are courts handling these human rights cases? How are judges perceiving them? And what does all this mean ultimately for urban water governance? And so in terms of methods, we used archival research, interviews, participant observations, and very importantly, analysis of court cases. So fortunately for us, we had completed most of our field work last year. So um, uh, now the work is more uh, desk research. And as we uh, go through these court cases, we often need to go back to our interlocutors, our partners in India to understand the meanings behind the court cases and go back and contact the lawyers who were our partners to understand the intricacies of, and this is why we, the work that we are doing now and uh, most of that can be done virtually. So uh, the challenges that Ruth laid out so beautifully um, um, fortunately for us, we are not facing that right now, but I will use that opportunity to reflect back on if we were doing this field research at this time, what would it mean? So that is how I'm approaching the rest of the presentation. And um, I will begin by thinking a little bit about urban commons, because most of my prior work was also on the rural commons. And I think what strikes me about urban commons as opposed to rural commons is the very large diversity of people who live in cities in very differentiated settlements, all the way from gated communities, which yes, we are seeing increasing number of gated communities in Delhi, to the slum communities and the very wide variety of migrants that come to these urban areas. And these could be migrants who come just for the day to work in the city and their residence is out of the main city boundaries to people who have left their families behind and they come now and stay in the cities. And I think we have not put as much attention in thinking about these large diversity of people uh, who constitute this migrant population. And this then is what brings me to um, how um, I'm relating this to, sorry, um, the COVID-19 crisis. So as uh, Ruth was mentioning in India, now there is a lockdown and people have been asked to stay at home. But in the urban context, um, there is this question of what is really home, particularly for migrant population. And this is a picture you might have seen, it's circulated quite a lot of migrants flocking to bus stations and railway stations and so on, when they heard that there might be a lockdown. And you see all these people, and there were um, thousands of people who came to this big bus station in Delhi. And these are all migrant people who largely work on construction sites. And on the construction sites, that's the place where they also generally um, sleep at night and where they live. But once the lockdown was announced, these migrants were asked to vacate these places. And now there was the question of what do we do about them? And, and these people were so, I think, panicked about it that they just wanted to get back home. So the reason why I'm showing this picture is I think it's a very good illustration of how, uh, of, of A, the multiple risks and the panic that was created. Um, and how the message of the lockdown was communicated. So the message about the lockdown was communicated by the prime minister um, on March 22nd. 
and without much pre-warning or communication to the people on what that would mean. And this is, I think, very closely related to how we think about urban commons on where there is home and what responsibility is there for these people who are living in urban areas. So I'm sorry, this uh, caption is getting a little cut here. Um, so we have more than a million people uh, who have believed uh, to have left India's cities since the lockdown. And this was immediately after the lockdown was announced. Now I believe there are even more. So uh, here you see people taking all kinds of risks, sitting on top of buses. And where is the physical distancing here? And some, uh, there are also reports of people who started walking from the cities to their villages thousands of miles away. Now, what I'd like us to um, take a moment to think about is what, um, sorry, um, what kinds of risks these people are perceiving. There are multiple risks here and how are they weigh, weighing these different risks to take decisions. And I'd welcome um, you know, comments on chats on what the COVID situation has meant for way people perceive risks, how they weigh the multiple risks they face and ultimately take decisions. So any comments you would like to put in on the chat box would be welcome and we can take them up during um, during the question answer session. So I'll pause for a minute while you think about this. So now, um, going on to thinking a little bit about um, what does social distancing mean in dense urban settings? And uh, I'm bringing this up because if we are doing any kind of research in India, I think understanding the context, understanding the context in which social distancing is happening is very important. So a big debate ranging in India these days is about whether social distancing is relevant in contexts like these dense urban settlements. And people have argued that the Western epidemiological models that were, um, that were used to arrive at these prescriptions uh, are not relevant to the case of India, that they have been used as panaceas all over the world. Um, and only now we are seeing some new models emerging based on local conditions, but the prescription of social distancing was largely based on assumptions which are not relevant to the India specific conditions. And I've laid some of them down here. Um, India has a much younger population than the population in, um, in uh, the West European countries uh, where um, particularly Italy, which scared everyone into uh, taking the lockdown measure. We have much denser settlements as I talked about the rural urban divide, we've talked about the mobility of population, which nobody thought about. This came as a completely unexpected shock to the planners. And then other mortality risks. So in um, developing countries, we have several other risks like the risk of TB, other communicable diseases like TB and malaria in particular. And the question is, what have, you know, um, what does this current uh, crisis mean in terms of how it impacts these other mortality risks? Um, and then there is, of course, this question of a very weak health infrastructure and the whole context of poverty and day-to-day -day living. So we, it's not like we are here in our US homes where we can stock up on stuff and we have the safety nets, we have enough money to be able to buy enough for a week, for some people a month. There is more day-to-day -day living and very limited storage available. And even for basic necessities, like I mentioned water and even toilets, most, in most of these slum settlements, you have shared water resources, shared taps and shared toilet facilities. What 
what does social distancing really mean in these contexts? And these are all the challenges, but there is also a positive spin which is being put, which is that probably people in India and in other parts of the developing country have greater immunity due to incidence of TB, which is also a respiratory illness and malaria. This is something going around in social media. We don't have evidence for this, but um, it's something to consider. Okay, um, now I'll come to, yes. Um, uh, I just wanted to remind you uh, to wrap up in maybe yes. the next two minutes or so. Yes, so I want to talk uh, particularly also about this prescription of washing hands with soap and water for 20 seconds, which is another of those uh, prescriptions that have been um, uh, prescribed without too much thinking. And the prescription is to wash hands at least 10 times per day and a single uh, wash implies a 20 second wash, which uses at least two liters of water. And in a context where you don't have enough water, for example, average water consumption for urban India is 91 liters per capita per day. And you're talking about hand washing, which involves 80 liters just for hand washing. Um, so there is, um, just to my concluding slide then, uh, which is the implications for common research. Some lessons from common research that are relevant here is that there are no epineseas that Ostrom kept reminding us that there is need for detailed context specific case studies so that we can accumulate knowledge instead of applying these epineseas, need for more collaborative multidisciplinary solutions that particularly combine the social and economic with the epidemiological um, models. And then of course, the role of communities, social networks, and bringing in polycentric governance. Um, and this is also this whole I, um, crisis has brought into question new kinds of social dilemmas. So thank you very much. With that, I will end my uh, talk and stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Rim Jim. Very interesting. Um, so during the remainder uh, of the time we have, we'll have uh, participants sending questions to the Q&A tab, which is about in the center at the bottom of your screen. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight here I thought was really interesting is this pressure for us to do research and engage around these crises. And I think sometimes that can be viewed through a rather cynical lens. So uh, I think you're very wise to uh, raise that point. Um, one thing that really strikes me is this exposure of vulnerabilities. We talk a lot about robustness, vulnerability trade-offs and the vulnerabilities are hidden until they're exposed. So we have this crisis event, we have this extreme event that's exposing things that we don't really think about. Oh yeah, when we have, an epi when, it, when we have a pandemic, we'll just wash our hands all the time. Never really thought of that. Uh, and the difference between day-to-day -day living and, and what we can do here with the massive infrastructure that we have. So let me, uh, let me open up to uh, questions now. We have a couple questions coming in. I'll, I'll start out with a question here about the future of um, CPR research in the context of this pandemic. What suggestions do you give a PhD student who's already completed you know, uh, uh, comprehensive exams, is about to, to go to the field to collect research? Um, how, do we, how do we cope with, uh, with the impact of the pandemic? I guess, as Ruth would say, lots more phone interviews. <laughs> Go ahead, Ruth. Yeah. Oh, well, I was hoping somebody else would have a bright idea. I mean, <laughs> phone interviews, uh, in my own dissertation work, I, I was all set to go. I had Fulbright and another grant and all set to go do field work and things came up and I ended up having to use um, an existing data set to do my analysis. Um, in the end, it wasn't the end of the world for me. I That's why I've got a job at IFPRI, as it turns out. So um, one thing as, as a short-term answer would be to look at what existing data may be available. And sometimes that means putting things together in creative ways, using secondary data along with, um, you know, uh, 
other kinds of data that have been um, that may not be fully exploited. There's new almost day to day there are new possibilities for using GIS with other kinds of data. So you know those are some ideas depending on what you're really interested in. Rim Jim, you may have yeah. or Marty yes, I, I, um, first of all, yes, it is a very challenging situation. I don't want to downplay it. It is, um, but as we say, you have to make the best out of the crisis. So I think while you're facing these challenges, everyone will be, um, I think, sensitive to the situation you are facing. Um, and um, your advisors and other people, you know, when you look out for jobs, I think we are going to see a very different situation at that end also. So I agree with uh, Ruth about being creative with what exists. So one possibility would be existing data, as she said, secondary sources of data. For example, in India, we have a number of these like national sample survey, NSSO data, DHS data, and all of those you know, huge secondary data sources that exist. That could be a possibility. There is also the possibility of using some kinds of social media data, for example, Twitter data and some of these are proprietary data and they cost a lot and that could be a challenge, but that's another possibility to look at. I'm hearing from some of my partners um, in these developing countries about some rapid assessment surveys that the NGOs are doing. Ruth was mentioning about the surveys that SEVA is doing, for instance. So um, I think there could be possibility of linking up with local partners because they are also looking in some cases for researchers to be able to analyze the data that they are collecting. Everyone is now in a big rush to, um, to, to, to get some results, right? And they don't, as uh, Ruth was pointing out, they are overburdened right now with just providing the services. And I think we can play the role at the back end of uh, possibly analyzing some of this data. So I'm sorry, that's all I have to say. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's an opportunity for your creativity now. Great, thank you. Um, I just have a quick follow on question to that before we address some other questions that are coming in. And uh, I have some colleagues who work in with native communities in uh, Arctic regions, and they're getting a little feedback indirectly from the people they work with about being careful uh, regarding research during this time in the sense that these people say, oh, you've been talking to us for years and years and years, and not really much has changed, and now you want to talk to us during this horrible time? Like, what's your agenda? Mm -hmm. is, there any, is there any way to, to manage that difficult situation? And then if you do nothing, uh, you're in a bit of a catch-22 where, you know, you, you, when, when th times get tough, then the research stops. Or how, how do you manage for that kind of catch-22? So I was on a webinar this morning with um, colleagues from IFPRI's India office who are working on the nutrition implications of this. And one of the things that really struck me about what Purnima Menon was saying was, how encouraging she finds it that so much of the research that's being done right now is not about publishing papers, but of things that will provide answers to questions. And she was saying on phone ser surveys, for example, make sure that whatever question you're asking is something that is pertinent, is, is actionable. Mm -hmm. So that may be part of it. The other thing that we did with Sewa was we went to them and said, what do you want to know? Mm -hmm. and, and then we designed the survey around that to especially give them a greater voice in they already actually had quite a, an articulate agenda about what services and, and all their members need. But 
to the to the extent that we're able to link this and show how different how their members represent different parts of the food system and you know document this that providing some more research numbers behind it so maybe it would be going to these these other communities leaders and say what information do you need mm -hmm. and how can we provide that to you even yeah, if that is harvesting stuff from, right, yeah. right but it, yeah it's an excellent suggestion to say well what can we do to help you at this point? We have lots of knowledge. We don't know if it's relevant, but please let us know. So we've got some other questions coming in. Um, a question about uh, data collections um, and future climate crises. So let me start with that one. So what are the new opportunities for research, especially thinking about a future climate crisis? Can we learn how now to avoid a bigger problem during the climate crisis? Uh, this kind of ties in with some of the things we've been talking about so far. So uh, I think one of the big uh, lessons that has come out uh, that I see emerging now is people are becoming open to the idea of what we call wild cards or surprises in doing, um, in thinking about climate. So even when I teach about uh, climate adaptation, it takes students a little while to grasp this idea of you know you can think about you you've got to think about when you think about scenarios you have to think about the wild card scenario something unimaginable but plausible and this was very difficult idea to convey to students and then think about policy makers you know we don't have ideas we don't have time for your imaginaries and these scenarios but i think what this crisis has really forced us to think about is these wild card scenarios. So that is one big thing. Um, and then how do you prepare for uncertainties, dealing with uncertainties, thinking about risks and vulnerabilities, as you said, and the trade-offs among these. I think these are all, and system-wide changes. This is what all the way from thinking and planning nationally, which they have done in terms of lockdown, but the actual impacts and implementation and you know these big um, stimulus packages that have been uh, doled out, ultimately are they reaching people or not is something that has to be worked out at regional and local levels. And we are now um, challenged to think about how to link those macro level policies to what happened at regional and household community levels. I think these are all very important lessons for climate change. Excellent. Um, the next question has to do with uh, data collection. So we've been talking about challenges of collecting data vis-a-vis uh, -vis the question about graduate studies. Um, we have one here that suggests or asks, uh, could, could the type of knowledge we generate change in positive ways um, because we're collecting data in new ways? So perhaps changing how we conceive the role of the researcher uh, on his or her own research, looking for new ways of assessing the quality of a dissertation, for example. Mm. Yes, I, um, that's the point I wanted um, that I highlighted in my slide. I think I, or I hope that this crisis leads us to think, to rethink the way we do research and we evaluate research. So for instance, in the work I'm doing in urban uh, parts on um, urban India on provision of basic services, there are organizations like the Slum Dwellers International, which have which now have local people collect their own data. This goes back to Ruth's point about asking communities what kind of, uh, how can we support them? How, what kind of data do we need? And I'll give a very quick example. So when we go asking people about basic services in the secondary sources of data, which the government collects or which when external researchers go and collect, they ask about what is the distance to the water source? How far do you have to walk? But if you ask people who are really experiencing that situation, it's not just the distance, it's the terrain. It makes a whole big difference if you have to climb a set of stairs to go down, go up, get water, uh, whether you have to pass through unsafe areas because women generally collect water. 
What time is the water available? Is it available during daytime or nighttime? These are some of the insights that can come up only when you really engage with local communities. And if you have people collecting their own data, which some organizations now are doing, could there be ways where we can then um, align with them and find out, as Ruth was saying, what aspects of that data analysis we can help with? So maybe we can bring in these techniques about GIS or analysis of spatial data or modeling mm. and things like that, that that is what we bring. Mm. Uh, Interesting. Mm. Ruth, do you have anything to add? I like that idea of working with the citizen science. The, on the SDG reporting, there is a parallel reporting framework that is very much citizen science or citizen reporting. And I think there could be a really interesting area for dissertation to work at that interface of validation, for example, of comparing the different data sources. Mm. And, and if you do that, then that, that provides greater, um, greater credibility to those uh, citizen reporting initiatives to use those in the accountability frameworks. Mm. One other quick point I would mention is that we have found in our work that one role university researchers can play is to bring these different communities together. You know, you would think that one slum dweller association here and another here would be exchanging lessons, but it doesn't happen. You would be surprised even within the same city. And I think sometimes we have to, I have to be very careful when I say this, this has to be negotiated very carefully, but there is an opportunity for an external player, sometimes in situations which are very politically charged to play the role of a neutral broker that brings these communities together to at least exchange lessons. We are not there to tell them what to do, but at least provide a safe place for communities to exchange lessons on what happened. Like in Mumbai, there is a slum settlement that was able to actually use their citizen collected data, take it to the municipality and get the municipality to provide services. And those are kinds of exchanges that can be shared with others. Thank you. Uh, kind of building on that point, uh, we have a question about uh, dealing with diverse populations and social complex complexity at different scales. Uh, and and uh, one of the attendees asked or suggested that it seems like there's a trade-off between rapid response and effective response. Yes. Uh, especially in the midst of ra a rapidly evolving mm. crisis. Uh, have you have any experience with this trade-off specifically in India? Either of you? So, FES, Foundation for Ecological Security, I think did a phenomenal job of a rapid, increasing the effectiveness of response. So with this whole migration crisis, the, the return, you know, everybody being suddenly having to go back home, wherever that was, that Rim Jim showed the pictures from the urban side, people were ending up there were no there was no transport they were having to walk just huge distances so fes had a um uh, india observatory that was all kinds of gis data they quickly deployed that to identify where were the migration routes going to be and say these are the places you need to put feeding centers and water centers and provide emergency assistance to those people. So they quickly deploy, brought together the GIS information that they had to with this kind of direct um, intervention and, and coordination. So I, I think there's there's not always a trade-off, but if you move quickly without thinking it through, there might be. Mm. Other thoughts, Rin Jim? Yeah, I think uh, not so much in my own research, but uh, this is a point that has been brought up with uh, the Indian handling of the situation of, you know, because this whole situation seemed so urgent, 
there was need for the government to respond very quickly. And I think we had these uh, social distancing, these lockdown mechanisms placed in a blanket way, which was, as you said, um, a ris rapid response, but perhaps not very effective. And now I think we as researchers can play the role of bringing in more local and context specific conditions into those, into those modeling efforts. Oh, excellent. Uh, both of you have sort of an, uh, answered two questions that have come up related to this issue of sort of blueprints and panaceas and rapid response. You have to have something that you can do quickly, as well as the social response of the herd mentality idea. So, so here, I think in the West, we've experienced it with toilet paper, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's not so dire as, you know, crowds and buses and, and, and working, you know, the herd mentality working directly against uh, the social distancing measures that are, that are being implemented. Uh, very difficult challenge between um, managing uh, these different uh, types of risks. Have you had any other experiences in that space where you've got these direct conflicts between um, policy at the national level uh, or broad policy being tuned to specific situations. Ruth gave a great example of that, but I'm wondering if there are any others that come to mind. This is a great question for polycentricity, right? Yeah, I mean, to pick up on the, the we've, I'm, I was really glad to hear your, your part on the water issue, Rim Jim, because maybe because I'm coming from a food policy, we've had a, a bit of a struggle to get the water part on the agenda. And um, there are some innovations going on, like in uh, Bangladesh, they're promoting these tippy taps where, you know, you basically use a um, an oil jug or something that you put holes into that you can use to f for hand washing because the normal way of hand washing contaminates everything you know you, <laughs> you, and and so what um the the issue is that there's a lot of innovations going on but there's a question of what's a trusted one because mm -hmm. we've seen so much misinformation going on yeah. also about this so when you have a trusted organization like sewa is really trying to promote with its members or BRAC in bangladesh um, and maybe that goes to this issue of establishing long-term relationships that build trust so that quote unquote scientific information is is trusted mm -hmm. No, I think that's a great point about trust. I think this is coming out a lot, particularly in the currently communally divided situation in India. It's very difficult. I, I get WhatsApp feeds from various kinds of groups and you can see they are all promoting their political ideology. And the trust in the government and trust in NGOs and whatever, this is, this is absolutely paramount. That's one point. Second point, I want to quickly go back to one of the previous questions also about lessons. We need to keep, remember that we are likely to have a second wave of COVID. So suppose whenever this, the curve does flatten in India, there is a very high probability that it, we will see new emergence of, uh, uh, a large number of cases they are saying in winter or in fall. And the question I think our real test would be whether we have learned from this enough to be able to, how, how well do we cope with the second wave? And in the second wave, the trust issue is even more important. Like do the people trust that the lockdown really happened because it had huge economic costs and costs on lives of people. Well, that speaking, would depend. Mm -hmm. speaking of a second wave, uh, I have to say that the first wave of this talk, uh, this webinar has come to an end. It's 1 uh, p.m. I, I guess <laughs> we could stay on for a few more minutes, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers for a very interesting discussion today that has wide ranging implications for the kind of work that we all do. So thank you very much for your time.
and efforts, uh, and we'll shut down the webinar uh, now. And if you have questions for our panelists, you can always contact them directly. Uh, I'm sure they're always interested in having uh, interesting conversations about their research and yours. So thank you, everybody. And we'll be back in two weeks' time for